Please be seated. This is case CV 12-859, Miranda Beltran versus RICO. Time set for oral argument. Council, let me advise you that these matters are being audio and video recorded, and there is a link to these proceedings on our court's website, so I want you to be aware of that as you make your arguments. Please identify yourself and your client when you make your comments and when you commence your argument. You both have 20 minutes. Counsel for Appellant, you can reserve time for rebuttal. Just let us know. Uh, we have read your briefs. We've discussed the case. We've conferenced it. So we're quite familiar with the issues in your case. The clock on the podium in front of you will keep track of your time, and you may proceed. Counsel? Good morning, Your Honors. <clears throat> Jimmy Barunda, attorney for the plaintiffs, the appellants. May it please the court. <clears throat> Your Honors, please let me comment briefly on the point we, we raised in our briefs regarding the Arizona Constitution. As stated in our reply brief, we do not contend that summary judgments cannot be granted in tort cases, only that on damage issues, every presumption is that juries <clears throat> determine the extent and amount of damages in Arizona. Our Constitution warns trial judges not to, make, not to take such matters away from juries. And, and if there is any reasonable way that a jury may find for the plaintiff on a damage claim, it must be allowed to do so. And with respect to the emotional distress claim, Judge Foster stated my clients were not in the zone of danger and that they suffered no personal physical injury. Case laws apply to the facts do not support such a ruling. In regard to the zone of danger, this is a case where a drunk driver with a blood alcohol content level of 0 .232, almost three times the legal limit, he crashes his car into a, a house at a, at a very high rate of speed while everybody's asleep. <clears throat> the crash demolishes the small three-bedroom house and the drunk driver comes within inches of killing a, an 11 year old boy sleeping in, in the bedroom and the house gets flooded by shattered water pipes. The fact that the car didn't crash directly into my client's bedroom, that hardly indicates that, my, that the crash did not create an unreasonable risk of bodily harm to my clients. Counsel, can you point me to any case that has uh, injuries such as the injuries that your clients are claiming in this case such that they were sufficient either for a claim for negligent infliction of emotional distress or consortium? Can you name one case? Yes, Judge. The, the Monaco versus Health Partners of Southern Arizona, that case, under that case, uh, purely physical injury to a plaintiff is not required if there is substantial long term emotional disturbance. You think not, he. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. You, you believe the injuries are, are comparable in the Monaco case with what you've alleged in this case? Yes, Judge. And, and where in the record, in Monaco, Mr. Monaco suffered PTSD um, from the, the negligence and long term couldn't sleep couldn't relate to his grandchildren, couldn't relate to his children, had a, 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 a long-term incurable fear of developing cancer. Um, where in the record specifically do you provide evidence that um, the parents in this case, the parents, mother and stepfather, suffered equivalent long-term emotional injury well judge in the affidavit submitted by the parents the parents state that that they suffered uh, emotional stress from the from the the little boy the 11 year old boy at the time he had uh, suffered a, a scar a permanent scar a small scar on his leg right but, we're, but what kind of emotional long-term emotional distress did they did they say they suffered well, also that the, that, the, that the little boy was having nightmares 
after the ac uh, after the accident. I understand that. That went on for a short period of time, right? A year, six months, something like that. But what emotional distress did they suffer? Long-term emotional distress did the parents suffer based on their affidavits? Well, that the that the little boy was having nightmares and that the the parents, uh, the mother could not had to sleep with the little boy because he was having nightmares. How long did that go on? That went on for, uh, I think, a little more than a year. And as a result of that, the the parents never hardly ever slept. They ever, never even slept in the same bed because of that reason. And that was what, well, was one of the reasons what contributed to the divorce. Just to be clear, the claim that the emotional distress claim, that's for the parents' own emotional distress that they suffered from this incident, or is it the emotional distress they suffered in seeing what happened to their children? Well, right at, immediately right after the crash, the the parents went to the kids' uh, room and they witnessed the kids screaming and yelling, and they were terrified. And the obviously the uh, there was man uh, there was uh, there was manifestations of, of of fright when the when the parents witnessed all that all the all the kids' actions. So they. It's a third party claim that as, as third parties, as parents, they witnessed the uh, distress and shock that the children were going through and that caused them emotional distress. That's the nature of the claim. I got that yes, right. Yes, and also that uh, there was other problems too because the, the mother told the, uh, told the husband to, to build a railing or to build some kind of wall in front of the house to to prevent this from ever happening again, and the the, the husband said that he didn't ha he couldn't afford it, he didn't have the money to do it, and he he never did it, and I'm that not, caused emotional distress. That the I'm not following you. What the, the well the mother told instructed the husband to build a railing or a, a block wall in front of the house to prevent this from happening again, and the husband never did it, and that caused the wife or ex-wife to suffer emotional distress. Correct, and also... But that stemmed from the trauma that the children suffered, ultimately, yes. right? That's the source of it? Yes, and also, the, the, uh, as stated in the, um, the, uh, the Appalese statement of facts, the, the mother had told the husband to sell the house and to move out to purchase another house, and the husband refused. That caused more emotional distress. So it's like a domino effect. Is that what you're saying? That because they they saw the the emotional distress and the possible harm to the children, that led to the mother sleeping with the child, and then that led to the divorce, or that then that, that led to the the mother insisting on a railing, and that led to the mother insisting the house be sold, and that led all of that led to the divorce. So it's like a domino effect. Yes, Judge. Is that what you're saying? Yes, Judge. Okay. And um, it's important to point out, judges, that the uh, my client's bedroom was in such proximity to the children's bedroom that there was a very high risk that the drunk driver could have he could have kept gone crashing into their bedroom. So obviously, the there was an unreasonable risk of bodily harm to my clients. What, what, what was the loss of consortium claim? Is that the loss of consortium between the parents, or between the parents and the children, or both? Well, under Judge under Arizona, there's uh, the there's a loss consortium between the parents and the children, and also th between the, the spouse to spouse relationship. And you're alleging both. Yes. But counsel, was that 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 spouse to spouse the last loss of spousal consortium was that raised clearly below in the trial court? Was that raised? Yes, Judge. In, in your complaint. Yes, in the complaint, and also the uh, in the affidavits that we submitted. Okay. Judge, it's also important to point out that their presence in the zone of danger was absolutely concurrent with a serious fear for their children's safety as well as their own safety. 
And the, the Keck versus Jackson case said that the test is whether the defendant has created an unreasonable risk of bodily harm to the plaintiff. And that test was easily met here. And, and also, as I pointed out earlier, in the Monaco case, that the, uh, the court said that purely physical injury to a plaintiff is not required if there is substantial long-term emotional disturbance. And certainly the emotional stress my clients suffered from finding their home destroyed and actually witnessing the kids screaming and crying and that their lives were endangered immediately after, immediately after the crash, that justifies a jury to be impaneled to determine their damages. And with respect to the Lost Consortium claim, Judge Foster, he granted summary judgment because he said the record shows no permanent physical disabling injury to the kids. That is factually true, but that is not a basis for throwing out the claim. Under the case of Barnes versus Outlaw, there is no requirement that each person in the loss of consortium equation must have sustained a physical injury. According to the Barnes case, when there is a question about the merits of a loss of consortium claim, the court should rely on the fact finder to determine the legitimacy and extent of any alleged damages. Um, please keep in mind that there are two bases, as I stated earlier, there's two bases for the loss of consortium. One is the parent and the child, and the other one is the spouse and spouse. The, the extremely drunk driver crashing his car into the house not only damaged the parent-child relationship, but it also led to my clients getting divorced, as I stated earlier. And under the Arizona Constitution, my clients have a right to present that contention to a jury. As I admitted in my briefs, proven damages in a case like this may be an uphill battle because of the lack of, any, uh, of anyone being seriously injured. But trial judges in Arizona are just not permitted to make that judgment themselves. They must allow a jury to decide such issues. Are you suggesting that this is just an absolute right to present damage claim? I mean, isn't this governed by the motion for summary judgment standard? Is there a genuine factual dispute or not regarding causation? Can a judge in a motion for summary judgment context say, there is no genuine dispute. There is no causation and grant summary judgment. The, the Constitution doesn't preclude that, does it? No, but the, but the, the, the Constitution uh, affords uh, citizens a right to present any, any damage claims to a jury. No matter what? Any, any, damage, claims to a, any damage claims to a jury. The legitimacy and the extent of the damages to a jury. What, what if there's insufficient evidence to support the damage claim? then the judge could grant a motion for summary judgment or a directed verdict, right? Yeah, I, I, I agree, Judge. If there's insufficient evidence, the judge could grant summary judgment, but... That's not a violation of the Constitution, though. No, that's not. Okay. But but in this case, we, uh, I believe that enough uh, sufficient evidence was submitted with the affidavits that were submitted. Thank you for your consideration, Judge. Thank you. Counsel? Good morning, Your Honors. Neil Thomas and Brian Rubin on behalf of Flanders Rico. You heard the basics of the facts, and it's clear that you are well aware of exactly what occurred with regards to the physical activities of a vehicle going into a house. Um, we've been complimented for, in the reply brief for trying to defend the indefensible, but in my view, there's really no claim. And the reason there's no claim is plain and simple. You're only ask, being asked to review the record, in essence, whether there were sufficient evidence to meet the elements of the two torts that are here. Today is the first day we've ever heard about spousal loss of consortium. It wasn't raised. It wasn't briefed. It wasn't argued. It was never there. I don't know how I point to a record to tell you that it was waived, but I can tell you it's not there. Um, if, if the suggestion that the husband and wife are being divorced is sufficient to raise spousal loss of consortium, um, that's about as close as you can get. And what I heard when we talked about the domino theory a moment ago was really a Paul's graph defense, which would be obviously made if we were getting it that far. Now, let me tell you what this case is not about. It's not about whether somebody was damaged or whether there was an unreasonable risk of harm to somebody. We're not on to the damages side. We are talking about the components of two torts, the loss of parental consortium for the, because of the injuries to the child and then bystander negligent infliction of emotional distress. 
I don't have much to say on the bystander case because on the record in the court, Mr. Barunda recognized and stipulated on page 26, I believe, of the oral argument transcript that there's no evidence of any physical manifestation on the parents. That ends it. But there's three words for the negligent infliction of emotional distress. Witness something, zone of danger, physical manifestation, actually. For Monica. Words. Monaco is a direct, a direct injury to the, in, to the plaintiff. That's it. It's talking about the plaintiff who had been involved in certain activities with, directly with the defendant. It's just a typical tort case in which somebody did something allegedly wrong, emotional anguish is there, uh, a, a lot of symptoms. There's one of the cases, I don't remember off the top of my head, where somebody had chattering teeth, you know, and, and ground teeth at night. But that's because the injury, the effect was to the plaintiff. This is bystander negligence. That's why the three components are there. In fact, not long ago, I think in 2009, the Kaufman case was decided in which somebody wanted to claim because their pet had been, uh, and Roman versus Carroll, because of damage to a dog on a leash by another dog. The idea that you have an upset about something doesn't mean you have to have coverage. That doesn't mean you have to have a tort coverage. You have to have a tort coverage area in the context of, did they witness it? Were they in the zone of danger? And is there a physical manifestation? The record contains no affirmative evidence for any of these three components and affirmative evidence from the plaintiff's counsel themselves that there's no physical manifestation. So if this case has any close connection to any tort, which we concede it doesn't because it wasn't very hard to defend the indefensible in this case, is the parental loss of consortium claim. And the Villarreal case is child for parent and the Pierce case is parent for child. And they both make the same basic assertions as to how we limit this derivative claim. First off, there has to be a severe permanent and disabling injury somewhere. Now, I thought I heard some confusion as to whether that severe permanent and disabling injury in the questioning had to apply to, in this case, the children or the parents. The parents are bringing the claim for their loss of consortium with their children. The children have to have had a severe permanent and disabling injury. There isn't any evidence of that. You heard that the permanent injury is a abrasion with a scar. I don't think that reaches the level of severe, permanent, and disabling. And the Pierce case and the Villarreal case both say that there is, unlike in many other direct cases, this is a derivative case, there is a judicial threshold to determine precisely whether it goes to a jury on whether there is to be any recovery and what the amount of recovery would be. In fact, Judge Vosser was quite keen about how this is slightly different in this derivative area. And frankly, I'm probably wasting my breath because if you read his 26-page oral argument thing, you probably would be convinced that there's no case here because he had it down, the analytical basis for this particularly important. The next question. Counsel, before you move on. Sure. Did, did the children suffer psychological injuries? Um, I suppose I, where you I'm could going, say. There was the Barnes case. Okay, that the council referred to, because because I seem to re, I I re, read that case. Yeah, that as, case talked really about whether there was physical injury, and it was only talking about one component. This is the purpose of the consortium claim is to compensate for the loss of these elements, which can certainly result from psychological injury as well as physical harm. Yeah, but there must be the physical harm, and there must be psychological injury. And that would be fine if it was for the kids, and the kids brought their case. And as you know, that case was all settled and taken care of. This is the parents' case, and we can't confuse the parents' case with the children's case. And in fact, they were very clear in the, in the, uh, in the Pierce case that we have to be very careful about negligent infliction of emotional distress, where you got to be there. And we have to look at the loss of consortium claim, which is derivative. But even if you wanted to assume that a scar on a leg and some sleepless nights for a, children, for a child was some level of injury, um, it's not severe permanent disabling. The records that were before you show how transitory it was. Most importantly, there has to be some interference with the parent-child relationship in a normally gratifying way. That's the second threshold level. Uh, Dr. Holtzman, in his medical records and his later submitted affidavit, which 
wasn't considered by the trial court in summary judgment, and we don't believe considered at all because it was a dismissal of the motion for reconsideration. Never in any of the documents before you, inadmissible, not admissible, and we're not going to make a big deal over the procedural aspects of the summary judgment, never talked about the relationship between the parents and the children and how it was in any way not a normal situation. In fact, one could argue that mom was overly concerned and overly sheltering for these children and had a very good relationship and a close relationship with them, and that's the best evidence you have. And, and again, we have the threshold decision that judiciary makes before we go running off to court for anything. And I think what you've heard is really, oh, my client's home was destroyed, people got hurt, I get to bring an action for anything I want because there's a, a dispute as to how much money I should get for damages. But tort law doesn't work that way. And in order to be clear, we don't want to confuse the two torts that are before you. Both of these torts require threshold analysis. They both had threshold analysis, and they both failed. And you know, it's not one of those things where we can argue about three elements are in, one element might be close, you didn't make the element, you're done. No elements of any of these two torts exist. There wasn't a severe permanent disabling injury that interfered with the parent-child relationship in a normal gratifying way. For consortium, there was no witnessing, no zone of danger, no physical manifestation of the parents for the bystander claim. And with that, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to sit down. Otherwise, I'll sit down and listen to the plaintiff finish their time up. Any questions? No. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. counsel. Rebuttal. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> Judge, under the, uh, the Monaco case stated that the a physical injury was a physical a permanent physical injury wasn't necessary that emotional disturbance w was sufficient do you have a case that applied monaco to a bystander situation i mean monaco wasn't a bystander situation plaintiff was the patient of the hospital here we've got a bystander situation do you have a case that applied the monaco you don't need a physical injury as long as you have a long-term emotional disability, emotional um, harm to a bystander case? No, no, Judge. But actually, this isn't really a, a bystander case because the the parents were in the in the zone of danger. The drunk driver could have kept he could have kept going in, into the parents' bedroom. So it's a uh, it's on the it's a borderline of whether it is, if whether it is a, a a bystander case because the drunk driver could have wrecked into the the, the bathroom where there's a hot uh, hot water heater and he could have ruptured gas lines. Okay. So, but um, other than that, Judge, uh, you have any questions? I'll sit down. Any further questions? No. All right. Thank you, Counsel. We'll issue a written decision in due course. We'll take the matter under advisement. Courts in recess.